Rebecca Niederlander is an artist and writes essays, is a curator, is a health advocate, is an accomplice, um, is really a wonderful person. Um, they've spent, she spent her life really doing lots of volunteerism as well as being a board member, um, currently a board member for Transforming Family, which is where we had connected a while back, um, and is also on the community advisory board for UMass Boston study. Um, and I'll read the title of the study because I can't memorize that. Experiences of transgender, non-binary, and gender diverse youth with mental health provider assessments for access to gender affirming care. So more on that if you're looking to have details. Rebecca is your person to be able to um, ask and find out more about that. Um, she's presented, um, she's a skilled presenter and spends time really um, um, curating presentations and talks to be able to find the best way to communicate and evolve with what's actually happening in this field. Um, and so she presented on chronic illness in the gifted community at um, the 23 and 24 uh, Gift of Palooza, and also um, at the um, Sang National Conventions. Um, also on the uh, Sang National Conventions, which has been for the last three years and, and counting, uh, presenting on um, allyship to the gender diverse people in any of the lives of either the audience or anyone who's participating in the conference. And so um, the breadth of her work really spans uh, multiple um, fields or multiple areas of interest. And so she's really um, intentional about reaching um, a broad population with the subjects that she's uh, really passionate about. Um, in early 2000, she founded the therapy dog program at uh, Sycamore Home for Boys, and she ran that for five years. Um, and she's also co-authored a book. Um, that's called Just Listen, Affirming Strategies for Supporting Gifted Transgender Youth. Um, and so um, a book, essays, allyship, uh, presentations and conferences. The one thing that I will say that's unique about Rebecca is that when connecting with her, whether it was through email or um, meeting her on Zoom or on FaceTime or on the phone, is what's um, key with her is her enthusiasm and also her realism. And so as soon as you hop on your first call or your first connection, like you're going to dive into the thick of the subject, like straight away, um, not a lot of sugarcoating. And at the same time, a comfort and a love and a reassurance about it all. And so, and it's like, and if we can't figure it out, we're going to find a way to figure it out. And that's something that is really, um, that I would say describes um, Rebecca well and her impressive body of work. Um, Last thing I'll say is she's a creator. Her artwork um, has been shown internationally at uh, including um, the the uh, the Venice uh, Biennale, and she also has a TED Talk. It's called "The Art of the Journey." It's from 2013, and you have to watch it if you haven't seen it. So tonight she will um, speak um, to us and um, educate us on uh, neurodiversity and gender diversity and making the connections um, to giftedness and uh, chronic illness. So Rebecca, we are, we are all ears and eyes and hearts. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, Isabel. That was pretty cool. Thank you, I appreciate your spontaneous um, introduction. I will say that just just listen um, is a, an article, not a book. I have I'm in other books, but that's just an article. And that title just listen was uh, given to the article by the trans youth person that we wrote it with, um, which was one of the early things that that I learned, which was listen, you know, spend a lot of time listening to your people. Um, I, this is definitely a slide heavy talk, so I am going to share screen uh, and go big. Okay, is everybody seeing the screen, the talk? 
Beautiful. All right. So uh, I'm going to move you all over here. Everybody gets used to Zooms. All right, so trans and neurodivergent with chronic health and giftedness tossed in when the Venn diagram of existence is a solid circle. Um, you are gifted in many ways. This was not a uh, not one of those uh, images you get from one of the image finders. That was an actual uh, fortune I got from Panda N that I thought was hysterically funny uh, because we all find so much nuance and difference. Who am I? Um, you got most of that from Isabel. I will say that the person on the left is me at 17. Um, when we get to the talk about chronic illnesses, uh, this is me about a year before I had my first surgery for joint pain. We'll talk about some of that. And on the right, that's me with a massive uh, mast cell activation flare that I didn't know was a mast cell activation flare, holding my one and only kid, my amazing, astonishing, fabulous trans guy who is now in college. Um, I always love that that they put kids in trans blankets when they're born. I always think that that's like a really nice touch that hospitals are like, sure, this is we're going to we're going to bring them all forth and and give them all the love and and, and share it immediately. I, I know it's a joke, but I, I always like thinking of it that way. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about a lot of the things that have come up and hope to save you some time um, so you don't have to go through a lot of what I did and my family did. Goals for this talk, uh, to learn about some different aspects of neurodiversity, to better support everyone, to talk about those multiple exceptionalities, um, to discuss a little bit about gaslighting and what to do about it, and to provide resources throughout to help you incorporate uh, for your own lives. You will notice that almost every slide has a little blue arrow at the bottom left. Um, although you're not allowed to record these yourself, I am totally okay with you screen grabbing any images that make sense so that you can get um, that information and you can pursue it anywhere. Like I was talking to our co-host this uh, right beforehand and I said, this topic is its own huge conference and I'm trying to dump as much information as I can. Everything will go kind of fast. Um, this talk is a significant info dump and it is, uh, imagine it as a, an ADHD brain performance art piece. Um, I definitely have ADHD and those who know me, I'm sure I can't see you right now, but Trish is probably laughing very hard. Um, so let's have it. So disclaimers. Uh, insufficient data for everything. A lot of things I'm going to talk about are things I'm seeing with all the different people I talk to. I will share studies, um, good studies, peer-reviewed studies, well-published studies when I can, um, but everything isn't going to hit for every single person, and we need more data. We need more studies around all of these intersectionalities. Um, I also always like to throw up a picture of data because Data was always my kid's favorite Star Trek character long before we knew about the autism diagnosis. And it all makes sense when you put it all together. So first off, OK, I didn't even realize this was the case, but this is Neurodiversity Celebration Week. Yay, right? This turned out, this talk turned out to be on exactly the right week. Um, Neurodiversity Week. Uh, this website is full of so much good information for for you to use with your schools, for parents, for everybody. Um, it's great information, and I love the way they talk about it. Uh, as you know, this this banner across the center that says "We are the change makers." It also it goes to "We are the visionaries." We are the policymakers. We are the, and the fact of the matter is is that. Neurodiversity, neurodiverse people are the canaries in the coal mine for everything. And I am incredibly proud of my own um, brain wiring and I wanna help you um, enjoy and be proud of the people in your life too. Oh, in part, because the truth of the matter is, and we'll talk about it later, if your kids are neurodiverse, it's almost certain that you are too, in some manner. It is genetic, so whichever the thing is, you can almost always guarantee it came from somebody in your family. Um, it's important to me, just as a matter of housekeeping, 
a lot of people like to talk about Judy Singer as being the person that coined the term neurodiversity. And um, I, you know, she was a huge advocate for disability. And as a disabled person myself, I appreciate that. But she was also super crazy transphobic. And I don't want to give her any credit that she doesn't deserve. The people that you see listed on the left are responsible for the actual terms um, and should get lots of credit. If you're nerdy like me and you want to go even further, this is a great article to talk about where all of these ideas came from, how they came apart, how they started, how they've been developing. It's good to know the sources. All right, so neurodiversity. One of the things that I've become super aware of is that people use the term neurodiversity or neurodiverse when they don't wanna say the word autism. And um, that's not correct. We should be saying autism and autistic when we mean autism and autistic because neurodiversity is ADHD, it's dyslexia, it's dyscalculia, it's dyspraxia. Um, there's all kinds of things that it is. Uh, it is also, it can be genetic in things like autism and ADHD and some of the others. It can also be acquired. So things like um, PTSD, um, certain kinds of epilepsy, some things are acquired, um, traumatic brain injury, bunch of stuff. So we want to sort of keep in mind that this is an all-encompassing term for all kinds of neurologic differences. And that's just a super important part of it. Um, people will ask me a lot of the time, you know, why are we seeing so much? Like, we, you know, I, I'll hear people say things like, we didn't have autism in our day. Why has everybody got an autism diagnosis? Or we didn't have ADHD in my day. Why is everybody, right? In the same way that you'll hear some people who aren't like, haven't got their minds right, say like, what do you mean there's all these trans people? We didn't have trans people in my day. To which I always say, yes, we did. People just weren't out and proud. And the, the easiest comparison I always make is left-handedness, right? That, and this is a common one that gets talked about, that we didn't have left-handedness because it was, people were, um, if you wrote with your left hand, you were corrected, you were punished, you were physically hit um, to, until you wrote with your right hand. Until we realized that that was um, obnoxious and horrible. And we started allowing people to write with whichever hand worked for them. And suddenly we had a whole lot more left-handed people, but then it leveled out. We happen to be at this moment in time in a period where people are being more authentic and we're, um, we are talking more openly about all of the different ways that make each of us unique and amazing. And so we're in a growth phase. It will level out. We know this. Um, trans people have always existed. Autistic people have always existed. ADHD people, everybody's always existed. Um, there's always the joke that, you know, sure, uh, there's no autistic people in your family, but, you know, grandpa really liked his stamp collection and uh, grandma only ate white foods. So, you know, sure, but nothing was going on. Right. So we just want to be clear, this has always been there. Um, all of these things have always been here. And I'm really glad that we live in a world today where we can be more open and authentic and um, be ourselves. Um, as I said, we're in a growth period. Uh, all the studies are showing that Gen Z is being more authentic, both in their sexuality and in their gender and they are leading the, the celebration. And uh, it's a privilege to be the parent of someone who is loud and proud and fabulous. And congratulations to all of you. Um, I always say when someone comes to me as a brand new person in the trans world, congratulations, your kid trusts you and loves you enough to be real with you. And now you get to be real with them and support them. So that's why we're showing it all up. The other thing I want to say about the rest of this talk is uh, I'll come back to this analogy before. It's, this is one of my favorite optical illusions. Um, change your expectations, right? Like when you are the parent of a neurodivergent person um, or you are neurodiverse yourself, you need to recognize that their path is not going to look identical to uh, you know, your neighbor's kids 
or whatever the neurotypical or allistic as opposed to autistic peers that your friends have or anybody else. They're going to be on their own path, but the mindset should be one of support um, and love so that you can turn that um, that unavailable bowl into an, a wide open available bowl of support and joy. All right, so uh, I'm going to go pretty quickly through a number of these things with my my beliefs about some of these uh, issues, and then we'll just keep going. Um, one person I will use a lot of um, social media accounts in this talk. I do often because I feel like there are a lot of people who can share a lot of good information in easy ways that are easy to read. And Trauma Geek, which is a woman named Jana Elizabeth, she lives in uh, North Carolina, is brilliant, super brilliant, and does incredible stuff. I actually paid for a lot of her slides uh, to support her because this is how she makes her living. Uh, many neurodiverse people will need to be entrepreneurial um, and uh, do their own stuff, and supporting them is important. One of the things that she talks about a lot is that for that neurodivergences are not things that necessarily need treatment, fixing, or cures. And the cures is the part that's important to me. Um, I, I'm a big fan of my ADHD meds, absolutely. But I don't ever think that, that having the kind of monotropism, which is interest-driven attention, or the kind of associative uh, cognition that I think of, the nonlinear thought process in which my thoughts will go all over the place, um, or my, in a, my time blindness, those things are never going to be fixed. There are things to be taken in as who I am and part of what make me whatever kind of awesome I am, right? And that's the same for all the people in your life. These are important things that help us grow as a society. Um, I will say that some people will, um, that there's a thing called TOVA testing, uh, which is a computerized testing. I When I did the TOVA testing, um, it turned out that my ADHD was six degrees of deviation from the standard norm, um, which we'll get into later. Um, and it's a combo. It's all the different kinds. These are some of the different kinds of things that that happen. And I didn't get this diagnosis until last June. And I only got it because my kid started telling me, um, mom, now that we have my ADHD diagnosis, I'm 100% certain you have it too. So maybe you should find that out so you can get help. And um, no one likes their teenager to tell them uh, more about them that they know themselves, but my kid was right, as they often are. Um, it's also important to me when I talk about ADHD to say that there are a lot of undiagnosed adults, particularly female people, who um, are fat, like me, right? That uh, my supposition, I've tracked this out with various doctors. Um, undiagnosed ADHD people often use sugar as a natural dopamine, as self-medication. People who, uh, in the past, people would smoke cigarettes. Nicotine is a big stimulant that gets used. So if you had a, an aunt or a great aunt who you thought was a little bit um, all over the map and, and chain smoked, that was probably them self-medicating for undiagnosed ADHD. And um, it's super common. It's also super important to point out that by the age of 10, ADHD kids receive 20,000 more negative messages than their neurotypical peers. And um, I post this to just as the kind of thing to remember, because the honest truth is we get frustrated with our kids. And there are moments when we're like can barely deal with all of the things and we feel overwhelmed. And I try to remember just like what the world pushes onto neurodivergent people and the messages they get and how my job as a parent is to contradict a lot of those messages and to make sure they know just how loved they are and how accepted they are for who they are. Um, add into that, just another thing. I just I like to give a couple of things to think about for parents. Um, internal restlessness, um, time, uh, time blindness, 
one of the things that I have discovered is really important in my family is that when my kid has a success, I reinforce it. I'll bring it up a week later. You know, that was so cool. You got accolades for that cool thing you did. And they'll be like, yeah, but it also took me blah, 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 too long to get. I'm like, nah, that's not what I want to think about. I want you to remember how awesome it was when you did this cool thing. And over time, I'm now getting feedback from my kid that says, you know, mom, remember how I did that cool thing and how I thought, I, you know, and they're, they're beginning to integrate this idea to pause, reflect, celebrate. It keeps and keep practicing this modeling of reinforcing the strengths because that's what they need. And they need to have that kind of modeling set for them. Uh, one of the other best things you can do if you want to do a massive deep dive and completely, uh, if you're also ADHD in particular, and you want to lose all sense of time, join um, Attitude. It's easy. It's free. Uh, they have webinars and articles. I mean, it's an endless amount of information. I can't possibly tell you everything that they will talk about, but it's, it's an incredibly good resource. I recommend it highly. I will also say that Chris Cleary is a trans affirming uh, nurse practitioner who is a prescriber and a person who does the testing for ADHD. He will meet mostly through Zoom. You only have to go down and visit once. Um, right now, there are so many people with ADHD that it can be hard to find a psychiatric uh, doctor. Chris is amazing and trans affirming. I will also include a couple of other people that I recommend highly for testing um, as we go through this, because I think it's really good to have people that we know are not going to be um, are not going to discriminate against our community. Autism is such a huge subject. Again, Trauma Geeks got some great stuff. The second link at the bottom, the Discovering a Trauma-Informed Positive Autistic Identity, is an amazing article with incredible resources. And I just, I want you to just go to some of these things and, and look at some more of these things about autism. Um, quickly, I will also say we no longer talk about, we don't use the term Asperger's because Nazis, um, and we don't use high, medium, or low functioning. We use uh, support needs. So high support needs, medium support needs, low support needs, because first off, um, functioning changes on day to day. I mean, you know, some days we all get up and we're barely capable of, of walking out the house and some days we're on fire. So it's, it's variant. Um, the autistic community also really wants us to use autistic as opposed to person with autism. Um, this is an inherent condition. It is also monotropism. Uh, bottom up processing, um, but it is it is inherent to who this person is. It is not a separate disorder. It is integrated into who they are in the same way that I'm a person with brown hair and brown eyes. And we want to integrate it and not pathologize um, existences. Um, the Trevor Project is another amazing resource for everyone here. And they have done a lot of research into uh, mental health issues and concerns. And I thought that this was a really incredible stat that they had. Um, so trans people really do, the, the connection between trans and autism is established, it's wide. Um, and it is higher even than any other kind of queer identity. Um, I really see this as a positive, um, not as a way to do any kind of psychopathologizing. I see it as trans people are incredibly aware of who they are. And they are like, okay, bring it all on. Like, how do I, they are the people who are the most clear at what it means to be authentic. And like for my kid, when my kids came to me at 15 and said, I'm trans, I was like, okay, awesome. Tell me more. Well, my kid came to me at this around the same time and said, by the way, I also think I'm autistic and I think I'm ADHD. I was like, okay, tell me more, right? Like these, this is about being 
like the thing we want most for our kids is that they live an authentic life, right? Like most of us spend our entire lives finding our true selves. We're that's that's the that's the life passion. And our kids are finding this out earlier and being vibrant in their own way. And um, and it's it's actually a real privilege to watch it happen. One of the things I think is particularly interesting, this study um, looked at, and I have to move names around so I can see the, the slide. I want you to look at the bottom one, right? So this was a study about uh, different uh, neurologic, you know, neurodivergent things in um, cis and gender diverse people. And look at the bottom. The last category is sensory perception how you perceive the world around you and how you perceive sensory experiences within yourself. Gender diverse autistic people score higher on being able to sense the world around them and the sense within them than any other kind of people. They're more connected to the rest of the world. And it's, they're gonna, it's, it's just, it's amazing. And it's, it shows up over and over and over again, how this plays out, pattern recognition. Um, you know, like this is, these are important things that are gonna take us as a society even farther and need to be celebrated. Oop, I gotta move this thing around again. Oh goodness. There we go. Um, because the autism discussion is so big, I decided to choose one little piece of it to kind of go deep on as an example of how we can take a little bit of information and be much better parents. Um, so autistic, so autistic life is another great account. I think that's this is on Instagram. Um, autistic people and the need to sit in unusual positions. You will see me move around and sit in different ways. I am self-diagnosed, by the way. Um, I have not gone and gotten a diagnosis because there's too many other things, but I, this is me moving yet again. So proprioception is one of the seven senses, right? The five we all learned about in grade school, we know them. The other two are proprioception and interoception. Proprioception is the sense that provides information to our brains about where our body is in space. Okay, now think about the last slide I showed. The sensory perception of autistic gender diverse people is higher than in any other population. So proprioceptively, they're going to have a way more intense understanding of where their body is in space and how it works. And so they're going to have more reactivity. So autistic people often have proprioceptive differences related to sensory processing, sensory perception. Um, and so it can be hard to sit in a typical or normal way. For many of us sitting with both feet on the ground or arms resting at the side means that our brains are not receiving enough proprioceptive inputs resulting in feeling uncomfortable and disconnected. That would suck, right? So people figure out, okay, so it, you'll see me do this. You'll see people, the people that, you know, you may have grown up being told, don't put your elbows on the table. My kid has been putting their elbows on the table since they were tiny. It, it's important for them to feel connected to the table and to the ground. Um, sitting cross-legged, um, you know, tailor style from even in um, armchairs, um, pulling knees up to your chin. It's not hiding, it's just feeling connected to space or leaning head and hands, feeling connected knowing where your edges are. All of these things are key. And they are not to be thwarted. They are to be like recognized as a sign that someone is giving you a nonverbal cue that they're feeling a little overwhelmed. So this person says, I prefer sitting cross-legged on the floor. I can tolerate regular chairs for some time, especially if I sit sideways or on my foot. At this very moment, I have my right foot tucked under my left thigh because that is where I always sit. Context matters. A more stimulating sensory uh, environment will be more distressful and will need constant shifting to give the brain the proprioceptive feedback to allow the person to feel more organized and integrated with their environment. 
So, you know, we've been told like, oh, yeah, they're, you know, doing all these things. You gotta, you gotta like, oh, look, this is, this is a cue, right? This is a, this is a communication style. These movements, these body movements are communication styles and they're communication with us about what needs there are. All right. So I'm, you know, I hang out in the gifted community. I'm more used to low support and medium support needs autistics. And so because I know um, of a number of high support needs autistic trans people, I reached out to one parent and said, what is the one thing you would want the rest of these you know, other people to hear about? And they said that supports for severe, profound, high needs autism include typers for communication and communication partners who are the people who can assist with typing. Non-speakers are still able to communicate. Some profoundly autistic people appear non-communicative, but we cannot presume. So always be asking, how can we provide materials and supports? So fundamentally, non-speakers still know themselves fully and deserve to live authentically, including their authentic gender. I have seen people be like, well, that's just going to be too much. I just, they can't also transition. They've already got too many needs. It's too much. And I always say, yeah, no, that's not really yours to say. Like yours is to be supportive. You're, you're their parent. The need and requirement for caregivers is to support people fully. And you cannot, even if there are high needs, they need authenticity. That's important um, and critical. I fully believe the best book on autism that's been written in God knows how long is Devin Price's Unmasking Autism. Um, Devin is a trans guy and a PhD a scholar out of Chicago. Brilliant book. Um, I cannot tell you how many parts of this book I have underlined and put little post-it notes next to and gone back to over and over and over again. You can get it um, as a actual book or Audible or through Libby and listen to it. Um, but this is the book you have to read it um, because it Devin is uh, Devin is a white guy, but is the book is thoroughly integrated with all kinds of um, other communities and letting other people speak for themselves in a way that I have not read in any other book and is current with language. Um, I didn't freak out. There wasn't any kind of, um, you know, you know how sometimes academic books are not really um, current, as it would say. This is the book you want to read. And if you want to work with somebody for testing, uh, Lisa Hancock, who is at Summit Center in Torrance, is brilliant. If you want to get tested for, you can do um, all of the neurodivergences with Lisa. Um, she is incredibly trans affirming, uh, she is not cheap, um, but if you can work with her, uh, she is one of the few people, one of the things about getting your trans person tested for autism is that because most of the testing materials were designed for young boys, especially for our trans guys, um, it can be a lot of people who aren't really nuanced on how on how to like work with the testing. Like if you have a kid who was assigned female at birth, they'll use all of the female test protocols for your kid, but your kids not should not be using the, the female ones. They need nuance and they need to be using some of the male things and be able to like parse it out and play with it because we're sitting on all of these different intersectionalities. Lisa gets it. And she is very clear about it. Um, I have met a number of people who basically are told like, no, your kid is not autistic. Um, and I'm like, did, you know, for a trans kid. And, um, and I often say like, what, what measures did they use? Which testing protocols did they use? Because if they didn't use all of the right ones for that kid, right? If they use the wrong gender protocols, they're not gonna get the results that they may need. So you need some, you need to work with somebody, or if you're not going to work with Lisa, make sure you talk to the person about what kind of protocols they're going to use. All right. What if it's not one or the other? What if it's both? Um, this is like, 
one of the favorite memes in the community. The autistic person says, I will cry if anything changes, while the ADHD person says, I will cry if I can't rearrange all the furniture right now. Um, I've always been the, uh, I will cry if I can't rearrange all the furniture right now, uh, which is why my husband says it's very good that I've done site-specific art installations for decades because I get a lot of that energy out by doing that as opposed to moving the couch around yet again. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a real thing. Um, so when they intersect versus when only one is experienced. I'm going to go through a bunch of these. I love Venn diagrams. I live on Venn diagrams. If you also do, then you are my people. I'm going to go through a bunch of these kind of quickly, just let you kind of look at them. When you got both, they, they both work together and they fight each other, right? So you can be even more creative, um, but it can be play out in different ways. Uh, I like this list. Um, you can see, you know, you can compare more of the autism, the classic autism traits, classic ADHD traits, but then when it comes in together, they go back and forth. This series from Sheila Henson is one of my favorites. Uh, there's 10 of these different slides. Um, I'll go through them kind of quickly. But I, uh, uh, the phrase all the things is one that gets used a lot in our house, like when, when none of us can explain anything, we're just like, uh, all the things. And so it's like socially awkward because of this, socially awkward because of speaking before thinking, or just socially awkward because all the things. Um, so I'll just go through a couple of these kind of quickly to sort of show you how some of these things play out when you've got someone that's both. Communication styles. Be aware that they're going to be different. And in the end, finding a way to have balance of over and under stimulation to stay regulated is a really important key. And every person's going to find a different way to do that. Now, the deal is when you add, okay, so we were looking at intersectionality of of autism and ADHD, when you add gender diversity into that, and then you add the trauma, just the generalized trauma of being alive as a trans person in the political world right now, it can be super overwhelming. And it's important to really think about how we provide supports within this incredibly dense Venn diagram. This slide comes from this symposium, um, which I took a couple of years ago, and I can't, there's no world in which I can recommend this any higher than I am at this very second. Isabel, have you done it too? You're nodding your head up and down. Um, Aiden Olson Kennedy and Joanna Olson Kennedy are a married couple. Aiden is a just astonishingly brilliant behavioral health PhD who is a trans man. And Dr. Joe, who we all call her, is the head of the Center for Trans Youth at Children's Hospital. And Darlene Tando is a social worker therapist who's a friend of theirs. And they offer this complex seminar, which, oh my God, just do it. Just figure out how to do it. Um, it's You will learn everything you want to know about everything regarding um, how to be the best parent of your trans person. Um, Aiden and I have spent a little bit of time talking about an aspect of neurodiversity called rejection sensitive dysphoria. And it's a, a fairly new term. There's two fairly new terms. The next one is all is, is the world of one of the other people in here and they'll laugh when they see it. But rejection sensitive dysphoria is a real thing. It's another kind of dysphoria in which um, there is extreme emotional sensitivity and pain and it may look to an unqualified therapist as a mood disorder. It is not a mood disorder and it does not need to be treated with medication. It needs understanding and it needs um, particular kinds of affirmation. So if you've ever been the person who like met up with some friends and then the minute you've all, everybody separated, you're like, oh, did they actually have a good time? Did I speak too much? Did I do too much? 
that's rejection sensitive dysphoria. If you've noticed your kids ever being like, uh, I don't think my friends really like me. I think they're faking it. I don't think anybody likes me. That is probably also rejection sensitive dysphoria. And it's very much worth looking into. Um, Attitude has a lot of good articles about RSD and it's worth um, knowing about. The other really important thing that's happening um, and being talked about a lot right now is something called PDA. The original um, sort of clinical term was pathological demand avoidance. The people in the community that, that, that feel that this is their identity um, refer to call, prefer calling it pervasive drive for autonomy. And um, it's a nervous system that like when it when it's confronted with just everyday ordinary demands of the regular world, like I should get out of bed and take a shower, uh, it just becomes overwhelming. It is a genetic neurotype, brain neurotype, um, and it requires specific understanding and to be worked with. Um, it's very, it can be prevalent in the trans community. Um, there are more people sort of recognizing it within the trans world because they're being asked to meet the needs of a world that is not theirs, right? They're, the cis world has got all kinds of expectations of them, including that they pass, right? For a particular thing when maybe they don't want to pass, maybe they're non-binary or maybe they, someone else's idea of passing is not their idea of what it means to be them in their authentic body. And they are getting so many messages to be something that is not that finally they're just like, fuck it, I'm not doing what anybody else says under any circumstances for any reason, you can all just back up. We got to approach it differently. And so this is a really, this is a list of some really great resources to check out for PDA. Um, I also thought it was important to talk about the relationship of neurodivergence and trans to food and nourishment, um, especially in trans teens. There is once a, a trans person starts to hit puberty if they haven't been blocked or if they recognize their own authentic experience while a teenager, if they've had some pubertal um, development, um, disordered eating is a very, very common self-medicating way of trying to stop that pubertal development from happening. Um, so in our trans mask guys, they're gonna, if they have started developing some chest tissue that's totally not right for them and they've got huge chest dysphoria, um, they can frequently start limiting their caloric intake to try to keep um, you know, fat tissue from building up and creating more chest tissue. Um, our trans girls will not like to see um, their hips widening in, in ways that are more masculinizing or their abdomen, they will, you know, they're getting that, that more adult male look and that's not good. And they want, they want that curved. And so they'll start doing some um, some restrictive eating as well to try to get back into more of that curb. Again, these things are that these things happen a lot, uh, need to be recognized. But also, I've heard a lot of people, I've heard many parents be like, well, we're gonna, you know, this my my kids gonna like go into an eating disorder program, they're gonna do all of that. And then we'll address the gender question. Then we'll look at the gender stuff. Then we'll think about, because we need to make sure that it wasn't all just an eating disorder. And, and I, I, I cannot tell you the number of times I've had to say, I need you to really rethink that um, because the gender is very likely what's driving this behavior and you've got it backwards, right? Do whatever is needed to be gender affirming, medical, social, or legal, and then see how that plays out. And I've seen it over and over again. One thing works itself out when you address the bigger question, which is that you've got a trans kid or a gender diverse kid. Um, also, food, like food sensitivities, um, aversion, like all of the things that happen. This this is an this is for ADHD ADHDers, which uh, I now understand why I hate doing cooking of any kind. I'm really lucky. My husband does all the cooking. Um, and there's lots of foods that I cannot eat. Um, oh, it makes sense. Uh, 
these kinds of things come up. Um, I've often also heard people talk about their autistic um, kids as like, why won't they eat more vegetables? Well, the fact of the matter is, is that they like a Cheez-It because the Cheez-It is predictable, right? It's, it's an orange square and they know exactly what it's going to taste like, what it's going to smell like, what its shape is going to be. But if you hand them 10 blueberries, every single one of those blueberries can taste different. They can be a different level of squishiness. They can be a different, the skin can be different consistencies. Um, it is not a reliable thing and it can be overwhelming in a person who's already feeling massively overwhelmed. So when you think, oh, my kid is too picky, your kid is actually just saying like, I need more consistency in my food. So you got to figure out ways to make the food consistent. Then surprise, surprise, they'll actually eat a wider variety. Um, the other thing is, a lot of us in neurodiverse worlds, like if I get hyper focused on something like working on this talk, I will forget to eat until about three o'clock, which is exactly what happened today. I get excited, I do a thing, and I forget. So reminding your people, oh, have you did you eat anything yet today? Um, my kid who is away at college has reminders on their phone that will go off at different times in the day to say, have you eaten anything yet today? Has any protein gone into your body yet? And they're like, oh yeah, no, I completely forgot. I got excited talking about to my friends about some punk band or some DIY thing. And I totally forgot to do any of that. Okay. Um, also away at college, my kid has the refrigerator and the microwave and they keep food in there, right? And they bring her food back from the cafeteria at school in plastic containers so that when they're hungry at 10 PM, cause they're like doing all the things and finally think about eating, they have food to eat. You just need to create systems um, in place to keep to support your people. All right, um, this recommendation came from a very trusted mom. Um, Gloria Williamson is really great at this stuff and is very trans affirming. So if this is something that's in your family's uh, situational stuff right now, she's a great person to go to and has both a Pasadena and a Newport Beach office. Okay, so I said giftedness. Um, there's a movement in front right now to identify giftedness as a neurodiversity. And I think it's absolutely right on. Um, gifted brains, this isn't about your high, um, your high ability, your highly motivated kid who just does everything and gets it all done. And so they're just happy all the time. This is about your um, asynchronous, fast firing neural network brain kid who is just sort of, you know, can do all the things, but is always thinking about some other thing. And there is a, often an intersectionality with um, other forms of neurodiversity we've talked about and with trans identities. Um, when my kid came out in high school, uh, he was at a the highly gifted magnet um, in LAUSD. And his teachers were like, oh yeah, we know how to do this. This is super familiar. Yeah, okay, what name does he want? What what pronouns does he want? Let's keep going. Because um, especially in highly and profoundly gifted communities, this is a this trans identities are common. Giftedness can be thought of as a neurodiversity with social, emotional, and learning differences. Um, elephant in the room. Um, I again I talk about a giftedness as a synchronous development with advanced cognitive abilities and heightened intensity. Have we talked about heightened intensity throughout the rest of this talk? Yes, we absolutely have. Um, so that's that's the way I like to I think about giftedness. And so I look at it as a thing that needs um, differentiation and um, awareness and support. Um, yeah. So if you have a kid that you think that you know or think is gifted um, and has also ADHD and or autism or other neurodiversities, you, you need to be following Katie Higgins Lee. Um, she's amazing and also incredibly trans affirming. And uh, this is a graph, the, a Venn diagram that she put out that lots of people use all over the place. Um, and she's worth paying attention to. Um, my favorite video of hers recently was a three-parter in which she said basically, um, if your kid just got a neurodiverse diagnosis, you might want to get yourself checked out uh, because it is often genetic. And I was really glad that she was uh, putting all of us on blast 
Um, because actually I wish I'd known about my own stuff a lot earlier. It would have made my life a lot easier. Uh, the other org I really like for these intersectionalities is uh, Chris Wells, uh, who runs the Dabrowski Center and has a podcast called Positive Disintegration. I really like the positive disintegration model um, as a way to talk about trans identities as well, because uh, the theory of positive disintegration is basically about how we break down and sort of unbraid all the complex things and then can rebraid ourselves in uh, a new and awesome way. And she, uh, they have done um, an episode with trans lawyer Ellie Krug and a friend of mine, the mom of a trans person, um, Tamara Grady. They also, the second one down below, they did an interview with Katie Higgins Lee um, called Celebrating Neurodiversity. And it's an incredible hour long podcast. It's just full of great uh, information. Okay, so chronic illness, and I'm gonna try to go really fast with this because we're getting long. Um, Finn Gratton did this great book, Supporting Trans Autistic Youth and Adults, and is quoted as saying, I have yet to meet a transgender autistic person, youth or adult, who is not dealing with significant health concerns. One of the most important things you can do to support a trans autistic person is to help them get the health care services they need. Problem, I, I concur 100%. Problem is, uh, it can be very hard. So also, um, one of my interests is in um, how gifted or any kind of fast firing neural network or neurodiverse brain um, responds to different kinds of um, conditions. And Ruth Karpinski's study looked at it. And as you can see, the rates for um, high intelligence, and I'm just going to call this neurodiverse, to be honest with you, these the rates of these things are so much higher. This was a study that interviewed 5,000 Mensa members and got 3,500 well-qualified responses and showed conclusively that we do experience um, lots of different kinds of health conditions at a much higher rate and also neurodivergent conditions, as you can see from the study. Um, and I, I wrote this on the side. I almost took out the health stuff, but with the Oklahoma officials now saying that um, next Benedict's cause of death was a combined use of antihistamines and antidepressants, which I do not believe at all. Um, I completely contradict that, and everyone that I'm talking to also agrees. Um, I've used combinations of antihistamines and antidepressants, antidepressants for pain stuff for years. Um, and we don't want to stop people from using the combinations of meds that work to support them in their multiplicities of experiences. And um, it will, this, just even saying this, um, is going to affect a lot of people and a lot of families who will be afraid to provide the right medical resources for their people. Okay, um, so we're going to get into this other part. So that link is uh, so you can make your own brains if you want to play with this with your kids uh, or yourselves. This is the brain hat. It tells you all about brains. And I want to talk about brains for just a second. Um, before I got my ADHD diagnosis, I had begun to think that I was developing Alzheimer's. And so I went in for a full neuropsych um, eval. And uh, fortunately, I learned it is not at all that I have any kind of thing. There's nothing wrong with my brain. And in fact, the parietal lobe was functioning at 99% of what's humanly possible all the time. Okay, so probably same for my kid, because that's my kid. And let's go back to that other slide where sensory perception was higher in gender diverse people than in anything else. The parietal lobe is the lobe that registers um, sensory comprehension, language, reading, uh, pattern recognition. Sound familiar to anything else we know about? It also registers pain. So if you've got a fast firing neural network brain that the parietal lobe 
is the one that's doing a lot of the extra work, you're going to end up with a lot of, of these conditions that I'm going to very quickly go over. Okay. It's also connected to vagus, vagus nerve work. Um, you will get a lot of people who will say that one way to work on some of these issues is to do um, vagus nerve stimulation or to do mindfulness kinds of things. And that's because the vagus nerve goes from the brain back here all the way down the spine and it, um, it integrates with um, all of your organs which means that it does heartbeat, digestion, your immune responses, metabolism, sexual function, sexual hormones, your sex hormones, so how they play out and everything. And so looking at how these things integrate within our trans community um, is gonna be super key. So there's the three main things I wanna talk about is hypermobility EDS, POTS and MCAS. Um, I really want people to know about mast cell activation syndrome because I have not yet been in, and I'm going to take this off because I'm sensorially being stunned by it. Um, I have not yet been in a trans and neurodiverse parent support group where somebody doesn't start talking about something. And then I say like, oh, um, does your kid get rashes? Uh, do they have GI trouble? Do they have bone pain? And they're like, yes, yes, yes. And I'm like, yeah, they probably have mast cell activation syndrome. So MCAS is one of the most rapidly growing um, autoimmune conditions. It was only named in 2007. So most doctors don't even know what it is yet, but we're seeing it maybe at rates of like 20% in populations. And what it is is basically your mast cells live in your connective tissue and they're kind of the first response. So like if you had a, you know, if you had a small dog that was very elderly and just kind of hung out, right, and the doorbell rang and they would kind of go, woof, that's supposed to be a mast cell. They're supposed to just like, oh, look, you've got a cut. They go, they see what it is, and they tell the brain, oh, it's a cut, send the right things. When mast cells, when you have mast cell activation syndrome, it's basically like, um, a chihuahua on cocaine with a with a like a death wish for everything and they will like break through the glass of your doors and windows and just destroy everything in front of them and so they degranulate they freak out and they um and it overwhelms the entire system and and when mast cells degranulate because they're in connective tissue and they're in all of the organs and they're in all of the mucosal membranes so um and they're in bones, um, they lead to disorders in every single system. And most doctors are not looking at all of the systems. They're siloing their attention to, like your ENT is like, why do you keep getting recurrent sinusitis? Um, and these things are super common and they play out a lot. Um, it's also important because one of the things that happens a lot in mast cell disease and EDS and POTS is anxiety. Um, but it is anxiety, not mental health anxiety, the way we all talk about anxiety. It's basically hypoxia, like a lack of oxygen, because the brain will send uh, red blood cells and oxygen holding cells to the site where the cell, where the mast cells are degranulating, as opposed to like keeping it in the brain. So then the brain kind of freaks out and, and you get the you get brain fog and you get what feels like anxiety, but actually isn't medicated with an anti-anxiety med it's medicated much better with an antihistamine, which will deal with the mast cells degranulating in every system. Uh, dysautonomia is autonomic nervous system disorders. Um, it's an extremely common occurrence in trans guys because 90% of dysautonomia happens in people who started out with um, uh, being assigned female, basically. Um, but it, uh, you can have circadian rhythm differences. You can be a night owl like I am. Uh, you can have uh, GI issues, delayed or rapid gastric emptying. Um, one of the easiest symptoms is if you stand up fast and you get super lightheaded as if like you're a little drunk, that's a dysautonomia sign. And it means that your blood pressure is dysregulated and the blood hasn't gone back up to your brain. These are important things to just know about if you're seeing any of these kinds of symptoms in your people, 
um, look into some of these other things. The last one that's super important is EDS. Ehlers-Danlos uh, syndrome is connective tissue disorders that um, make people hypermobile. Um, there are 13 different kinds. Um, I, funny story. So I was at a museum recently and I was in an exhibit and I looked over and I see there is a clearly like a young art student, um, gender diverse individual. I mean, we all can spot our people at this point, uh, even wearing a mask. And I see a cane. And I went over and I said, hi, um, hypermobility? And they said, yeah, I think so. That's what we're thinking it is. Uh, my, my sister also has it. I said, yeah, um, so T will really help you with that. And they're like, oh my God, really? That's one of the things we are wondering about. And um, yeah, it turns out that hypermobility in trans guys is super common. A lot of people don't realize the connection. Um, we don't know yet why it is. Uh, but we do know that there are a lot of other problems that often go along with it. Um, and that um, the, the, uh, there's a Norris lab in North Carolina that's doing very specific research on why it is that testosterone helps with um, hypermobility pain and why it, it, it provides relief in the pain. Um, I am very close to trying low dose testosterone myself, although as a menopausal person, I am not excited about how much more chin hair I will have to pull if I do that. Um, so one of the things that I asked a parent about um, EDS and about sort of what they would say is that um, the chronic tissue disorders of EDS can often mimic eating disorders or disordered eating things. And in part, that's because there are so many GI issues related to connective tissue and EDS because GI issues, because if your connective tissue doesn't know how to move your food along, you get bloating and pain and cramping and you don't wanna eat, right? And it's not that someone actually has a disordered eating pattern, it's that they have a disease and um, and it, it gets super complicated and figuring it all out is important, which is why I just try to put this information out there. And if it matters to you, or if it might be important to you, yay. Um, if you don't get an EDS diagnosis, you might get a fibromyalgia diagnosis, also very common in um, trans and non-binary people. And um, that's a thing. One of the reasons I'm always, I always think it's super important to talk about the relationship between fibromyalgia, hypermobility, and neurodivergence is that there's been a couple of studies, this is just one of them, uh, that looked at uh, the relationship between people who had fibro or hypermobility in a rheumatology clinic. And um, it turned out that of the people they interviewed, 69% were also autistic. And 43% had familial autism in their family. So like a parent or an aunt or an uncle or somebody else, which showed that all of these disorders are absolutely interconnected. And um, if your kid, if you know that your autistic or ADHD person or other neurodiverse person is complaining of joint pain, they're not just complaining. They probably have something real going on and it needs to be looked at by a rheumatologist. Uh, this is super important when you're thinking about gender affirming surgeries, uh, because uh, you have to pay attention to how these things will play out and what, what, how it will work. Um, so lots of GI stuff, completely long, so I'll stop. Also, pelvic pain syndromes, okay? Like, um, don't forget that this stuff happens and that a lot of the, that most people like, did you know that, that most doctors don't even have to study any kind of pelvic pain in medical school? So if you have a trans person who is less likely to go get exams anyway, they're not going to get told there. It's just complicated, but believe them, listen, find out about it. If people talk about it, look into more. I love the organization tight lipped. Um, I'm a part of it. 
and um, they're trying to change all of the things around pelvic pain. One of the reasons I bring up pelvic pain is this is an important case study. So uh, a neurodivergent trans man desired permanent sterilization and so went to their doctor and said, I want some kind of permanent sterilization. And the doctor um, who knew that they had hypermobility and MCAS said, oh, well, yeah, sure, we'll just, we'll do a hysterectomy and uh, you could just need to decide about removing the cervix. Um, and then that will be the best possible thing. The doctor didn't. And because the person was neurodivergent, they were like, okay, I trust the doctor. Everyone is speaking factually, right? Like straightforward, factual information. But they didn't really think about the hypermobility um, and the MCAS. Because with a person with any of these chronic conditions, if you, if you don't have dysphoria around having these organs, then you shouldn't remove them because then you do what we call organ Jenga. And if you don't have the connective tissue to support, then you can have organ prolapse. You can have all kinds of things. They had a, a full tubal removal, great, simple, one hour laparoscopic surgery. They're, they're permanent. It's all done. It's fine. And they're happy and they're living their best life. Um, but they didn't have to then worry about these later issues. And so we need to know about our people and we need to be asking questions. We, we cannot just assume that regular doctors know all the things that our people are gonna be going through. Um, I mentioned anxiety. The last thing I really wanna make people aware of is serotonin syndrome. I've gotten, um, I've talked to a number of families where their non-binary, trans, queer kid um, went in for some other, you know, had some other issue, some simple issue, um, and was had a reaction uh, to something, to a medication, because they had MCAS probably, and but uh, they were perceived as being uh, depressed and anxious. They were put on a serotonin medication. And then it got worse. Uh, I know of uh, one person who ended up in seizures for four years, couldn't finish high school, um, and has horrific uh, CPTSD now. Uh, the mom is a PhD and eventually started doing all the research and realized that the issues that they were having were actually serotonin syndrome. All the doctors were saying, whatever you do, don't take your kid off of their serotonin drugs. Um, they took, she took her off, the kid off the serotonin drugs. The kid got better. The, the seizures stopped. Uh, some of the other things stopped. And um, we need to be aware that we often think that our, our gender diverse people are depressed or anxious. And I, I really thought about this when one of the parents spoke today, like I'm hoping that the anxiety and the depression will sort of go away as we do more gender affirming care. I think that that's the right way to handle it. Um, a lot of times what you see, what people see as anxiety and want to treat as anxiety is dysphoria. And when you address the dysphoria, some of this other stuff goes away and you don't have to risk these other issues coming into play. All right. Uh, I'm also a big proponent of the use of ketamine in the right situations. I have one person I love who will do this work effectively. Uh, I'll just keep going. Gaslighting is a huge thing, um, but we're at an hour, so I'm going to keep going. Um, remember that teaching hospitals can be really great, but they can also be very siloed, and you may have to be the overarching person who looks at your person. Beware of selection bias. Um, not all medical staff trust trans people's um, definitions of what they're going through, and you need to be a you need to be that fierce chihuahua um, to protect your family. Uh, the last thing I always say is people ask me, especially with neurodivergence, about screen time. Uh, the NeuroWild account is definitely another one you should be following. And one of the things that they say is that especially um, for, they're talking about with autism, but for trans people, their connection, their online connections are critically important connections to their community. Using, uh, restricting internet access, um, can be a very dangerous way to keep people from connecting with people that are affirming and are their actual community that they're not with. Obviously have important conversations about how to be safe and not be, um, you know, not get involved with predators, but 
uh, neurodiverse people need screen time. They need that connection to worlds that they can, where they can pursue their deep interests and um, don't be afraid of it. Okay, last thing, gonna go through this super quickly. NeuroWild, uh, in summation, developing positive neurodivergent identity, it starts with you and how you affirm. Um, start at the beginning. We talked about there are some people who have littles. Highlight values. Show them what it looks like to self-advocate. My kid recently came home and said, gosh, mom, I was able to self-advocate with one of my teachers when they wouldn't give me my neurodivergent accommodations. I'm so glad I just know how to do that. I was like, yes, that's right. You just know how to do that. They didn't even see that I was teaching them how to do this stuff. And that actually, that makes me feel really happy. They're all over it. Incorporate them in their assessments, share information, teach them about different kinds of things, use the extras, work hard, and also learn about this stuff from neurodivergent people. Um, I didn't used to say what my stuff was, but I think it's really important to be honest and say what all of it is. Um, I talk, uh, Trevor Project has great stuff. Last thing, because it's coming up with a lot of people right now, make sure um, if you suspect any kind of neurodivergence in your kids, get it done and get it tested while they're still in high school, because you can get really good accommodations when they go to college and set them up for much better success uh, things like extra time, uh, moving in early when it's not so overwhelming, all kinds of stuff can happen. Uh, if you have, if you're a health nerd, this is a great group to join. This is the article. I can send you a PDF of it if you want it. Uh, if you've got a gifted kid and you're curious about all the queer stuff, uh, Sang has a really good uh, scenario thing that Orla Dunn out of Ireland did. I do host a private group on Facebook. Uh, for HDPG queer stuff, who are almost all neurodiverse. And you can find me here. And that is a lot of words. Wow. <laughs> that was amazing. That was all encompassing. All the things, as you would say. <laughs> it was all the things. Yeah. And I cut out so much, <laughs> just have to say. Absolutely. But to be able to put all of it together and also the thread, I mean, you let it, you let us right along. There was a lot of content, obviously, but you let us along really, really well. Thank you so much for doing that.